you're very welcome to this training on eating, drinking and swallowing. Um, some other acronyms and some other terms that you might hear during your day-to-day -day work um, will be FEDS, which stands for Feeding, Eating, Drinking and Swallowing, or EDS, um, so Eating, Drinking and Swallowing. And within Cheever's Town, some of the care plans related to eating, drinking and swallowing are referred to as a dysphagia plan or to the mealtime plan of care. So why is it important that you do this training and you know about this? So many people within our service have eating or drinking support needs. And the support needs a person might have can vary. Some examples would be somebody might have a physical disability. So that means you might need to physically support a person to get access to the food or fluid. Or it might be because they have difficulties at the mouth um, or during the swallow or within the stomach stage. And this could be caused by many different factors. So some terminology that we're going to go through here, which is going to be beneficial for you for the rest of the training, but also within your day to day practice. And um, so firstly would be dead ligation. So that's the collective name for all of the stages in the swallow. So if one or more of these stages show signs of difficulty, we say that a person has dysphagia. And depending on the type of difficulty within the stage, it will influence a person's management of their dysphagia. You are going to be working with a person throughout the day and every day we all eat and drink. So it is really important that you know how to best support a person with eating and drinking and that you know what the signs of dysphagia are. So first we're going to take a look at the anatomy just so you know where everything is um, during the process of the swallow. Um, so if we start over on the left side of the page, um, we have the nasal passage, so that's just the inside of your nose. Uh, then we have the outer part of your nose. And then we have the lips. Um, and then we have the teeth behind the lips. Uh, generally, we'd have our canines, incisors, molars, premolars. Um, but oftentimes we will see missing teeth, uh, no teeth or false teeth um, and dentures. Um, then we have the tongue um, and the tongue stretches from the front of your mouth all the way to the back of your mouth um, and that's described as being in the oral cavity. Um, so if we look at the top right hand side of the page we'll see the hard palate. So if you run your tongue along the roof of your mouth you'll feel your hard palate and then as it gets softer towards the back of your mouth that's your soft palate. Um, then so then underneath there we have the cervical spine. So if you get your hand and you just run it up um, and down the base of your neck to the kind of your hairline, uh, you'll feel kind of where your cervical spine um, is around that area. Um, underneath that then we have the epiglottis. Now the epiglottis is a leaf shaped um, muscle uh, which moves and closes over uh, the area in which is going down towards your lungs. Um, and underneath the epiglottis um, we have the vocal folds um, and the vocal folds uh, come together and they vibrate uh, to produce sound. So there's different sounds that the vocal folds will produce depending on how they're positioned. Um, so they kind of come together as, a, as another bit of a, a protective mechanism uh, during the swallow. So they cover over the airway. Um, so if we think about sounds that are nice, when the vocal folds are nice and lax, they'll have sounds like ah. Uh, and then when they're nice and tight, they'll have sounds like so sorry if I've burst anybody's eardrum just there. Um, so underneath then the vocal folds, you have the trachea or the windpipe and that's going towards your lungs. Now within that space, that small space there, uh, if we just run back up to where the epiglottis is. So the epiglottis generally will fold down to cover over the area going towards the trachea. But that other area that's there is where the esophagus and where the food travels down. 
Um, so you'll see in the next slide um, how that would work. So now that we know about the anatomy, we're going to go through the process of the swallow. So we can see the different stages um, of the swallow and how the different sections of the anatomy interact um, so that we can complete a safe swallow. So I kind of want to use the analogy of a toffee um, just to help you kind of think about each different process that's happening. So the pre-oral phase, if we think about that as getting the access to the food. So you've bought a packet of toffees, you have to take them out of the press or the cabinet. So you have to reach up, take them, open up the press, take the bag down and get your fingers to pull or prise open the bag. Then you have to pick out a toffee, then you have to unwrap the toffee, then you have to take the toffee out, you have to do a nice little grasp with your fingers again and then you have to transfer that food from the wrapping to your mouth. Um, with a steady hand um, so that would be you're kind of looking at your or your pre-oral phase and um, so you need to obviously have good eyesight during that time you need to be awake you need to be alert you need to have good dexterity and um, you need to be able to use your hands and um, you need to be able to judge the size of the food um, and judge how heavy it's going to be um, before you put it into your mouth um, so then we go on to the oral preparatory um, phase. So we pop the toffee into our mouth and our lips close. So our lips have opened initially and our mouth and our jaw has dropped open a bit and we've accepted the food into our mouth and it's on our tongue. So the lips close and then the tongue flicks the toffee either side to either side of the teeth um, and it gets broken down by the molars and um, for some of you you might even feel the sensation of it getting a little bit stuck in your teeth um, and so it's getting broken down by the teeth and the tongue is flicking it back and forth and during that time as well there's a lot of saliva being produced and overall it's making it into a nice cohesive ball and um, so also on the tongue you've got your taste receptors and they're um, sending sensory responses to say the weight of the bolus, the size of it, the taste and um, the texture. Um, and that's all sending a signal to your brain to say that you're doing a swallow at the moment um, and or getting ready to do a swallow. Sorry. Um, so then as you form that into a nice cohesive bolus, um, you'll start into your oral transit phase where you're pushing the bolus backwards in a nice wave-like movement on your tongue. So it's going front to back. Um, and then as this goes to the back of your mouth, um, again, all the signals are flying between your brain and your, and your swallow response within your throat, within the pharyngeal phase, which is the next phase. Um, but it's saying okay, we need to get the soft palate to retract and go up and cover the nasal passage so that food doesn't go up your nose. Um, and we need to start to, to move up um, the voice box within the pharyngeal phase um, so that the epiglottis can be pushed down to cover the airway. Um, so the epiglottis, if you remember, is that leaf-shaped um, muscle um, and it just pushes down, folds down, and then the food transits then to the esophageal phase. And just before that happens, the esophageal sphincter, which is kind of a, a the, the tight hole that's at the top of your food pipe, it starts to relax and open. Um, and that allows the food then to go into the esophagus and down to your stomach. So that's how our toffee has gone through. Um, and it'll be the same with the fluids and um, it'll do it in the same in the same way um, and if you can see there on the two pictures um, you can see the oral preparatory to the oral stage so you've got your nice cohesive bolus it's gone into the oral stage and now it's moving on the picture underneath you can see the epiglottis going down um, and covering over the airway and the bolus going towards your stomach. So now we're going to go through some signs of difficulty at each stage. Uh, first, we're going to start off with the pre-oral stage. So some signs of difficulty that you're going to see might include fatigue. Um, so if somebody's very tired um, or they're very difficult to wake up um, and if they're not alert, um, oftentimes they won't be suitable for eating and drinking um, and it can cause further complications during the swallowing process. 
Um, so a person needs to be as alert as, as they can be. Um, some people might be very weak um, and uh, they might have difficulties picking up utensils or they might have difficulties chewing. Um, they could have difficulties with dexterity. So thinking of that toffee, they might not be able to move their fingers to open up the toffee. They might not be able to pull apart a bag to get inside the toffee, uh, inside the toffees. They might not be able to pick up a utensil or grasp a, a handle or um, to pick up a, a spoon either or a fork. Um, and they might have difficulties with cutting. Um, a person can have difficulties moving food from the plate to the mouth um, and this can be because of physical disabilities. It can be that they have visual impairment, whether it's that they can't see the food on the plate or that they have difficulties with depth perception. So they think that they're touching the food, but they keep missing it. Um, or they could have blurred vision um, and not be able to see the food properly. Or it could be that they um, are seeing two versions of the of the piece of food um even if it's not there a person might also have a tremor so with the tremor what can happen is when it's um when a person has the food on a, on a fork um or or a spoon with the tremor it can end up falling um off the spoon or the fork um, and similarly with a cup that can happen too um, some signs of difficulty might also be impulsivity so people might um eat very quickly um and um kind of gather the food uh, very very quickly from their from their plate um and other people might overfill the fork or the spoon um which can lead to difficulties when it goes into the oral stage then um as i have difficulty interestingly it might be a fast rate of delivery um, by staff members when supporting somebody with eating and drinking um, that can lead to difficulty if the person isn't uh, ready to swallow or to start the swallowing process um, and if they're not able to initiate um, picking up a utensil they're only really initiating the swallowing process at the time that it reaches into the mouth rather than at the time when the person looks at the food and picks up the um, picks up the utensil um, and then also um, what can cause a difficulty is if there's inconsistent delivery. So if as a staff member you're supporting somebody with their eating and drinking and if you get called away in the middle of a meal or if you um, have to do something or you're asked to do something else um, and then the person is waiting um, and what that can result in is reduced um, intake of the food and the food can change uh, temperature. Um, and then another one would be distractibility. So people can get quite distracted by what's going on. Um, so that's really important to remember with the distractibility that if a person is in a wheelchair and they find it difficult to turn, um, that it's really important that their back is to a wall so that they can see in front of them um, and see what's going on. Um, some people now will need a reduced environment and not have many distractions around whilst their back is to a wall. But if their back is to uh, a door and the door keeps opening and closing and they can't turn around to see, they might get a bit of a shock or they, they, they might get distracted and, and try to see who's coming in behind them. Um, yeah. So the next one is some signs of difficulty at the oral stage. So some people might have a reduced lip seal. So that means that they can't close their lips. Um, so you can think of the food would fall out if they can't um, close their lips properly uh, or they might have a bit of drooling. Um, some people have difficulties opening their mouth. So um, they could have a very restricted um, or very tight or tense um, mouth opening. Some people have difficulty closing the mouth. So they don't often with difficulties closing the mouth, they're going to have reduced lip seal um, and um, they might have an open mouth posture, which can often lead to a dry mouth. Uh, or having um, drool or, or anterior spillage. So that means uh, food coming out of the mouth um, at the front. Um, excessive drooling. Uh, so that can cause skin breakdowns in the front of the face. Um, or the person might have a dry mouth. So that's also known as xerostomia. Um, and when you have a very dry mouth, it can be very difficult to 
generate a nice cohesive moist bolus um, and the food in the mouth um, it can be difficult to manipulate and a person might have reduced chewing ability and this could be because they've got reduced muscle tone we talked about that weakness in the last slide um, and uh, reduced dentition so a person could have no teeth uh, a person could be missing all of their molars um, uh, and another person might have loose dentures and the thing to look out for with loose dentures would be if any food is to pocket within the loose denture that can cause um, a bacteria frenzy feeding ground um, or the person um, might have reduced chewing ability because of reduced cognition um, and reduced awareness of the food being there. Um, a person might have reduced tongue control, movement and strength. Um, so they might not be able to flick the bolus either side. They might not be able to create that nice wave-like movement or generate enough pressure to move the bolus backwards. Some people might have um, developmental patterns that weren't suppressed. So you might see some tongue thrusting. Um, other people might have a tremor um, or they might have repeated and coordinated movements. And sometimes you can see them uh, within um, different presentations because of different things. So it could be as an effect of polypharmacy or it could be as an impact um, in like Parkinson's and different reasons um, and then some people it would be a, a pattern that they might have had since they were young and um, then you could have a uh, reduced sensory sensory awareness so some people might need heightened and uh, sensory aspects to the food and um, they might not be able to detect um taste or temperature um, so that can lead sometimes to people burning their tongue or burning the inside of their mouth um, and uh, you might see some people holding the food or fluid uh, which can be quite common within dementia um, that they're not aware that the food or fluid is still there and they can end up holding it in their mouth uh, you might see that food pockets to the inner cheek and um, so that would mean that the food would pocket alongside just between the kind of areas between your your teeth and your cheek um and that kind of goes along the the left and the right and then even at the front food can pocket in there um and the other thing would be that if somebody has a cleft palate um uh bread is one that really gets stuck there um and just to be aware that that food can pocket um up at, at a at a cleft um within the mouth and or if somebody has a very high palatal arch so very high hard palate um it can it can get stuck up there and um, the other thing would be some difficulty would be that if there's a lot of residue in the mouth um or on the tongue um and then if a person needed an excessive amount of time to break down the foods or move the fluids because uh, we have to remember that the swallow is, is all a muscle um so if we're very tired um it can lead us to not be able to make it into that nice cohesive bolus so some signs of difficulty at the pharyngeal phase would be penetration um, which means that material instead of going down towards the food pipe um would go towards the vocal folds um but it would maybe tip the vocal folds or uh, just go to that surrounding area um, but it would be ejected um, or it, you could have an aspiration where the material, the food or fluid would go past the level of the vocal folds and down towards your lungs. Uh, so some people might show this difficulty as coughing, changes in facial colour, throat clearing, doing multiple swallows, having a facial grimace and having a gurgly or a wet voice if they have changes to their breathing. Uh, they might sweat, eye tearing, um, the complaints of food, feeling stuck in their throat, and they might have recurrent chest infections. And the reason that they'd have recurrent chest infections is if repeatedly you have food or fluid going down into your chest, it can pocket at the bottom area in your lungs um, and it can be a breeding ground for bacteria. Um, another thing to note couldn't be silent aspiration. So sometimes people might aspirate um, on food or fluid and they might do so silently or uh, covertly. So you might not see the signs straight away um, or as obviously. 
Um, and oftentimes this is picked up on a video fluoroscopy, which is an x-ray of the swallow in real time. And then alongside this, another difficulty can be choking. So choking would be a complete blockage of the airway um, and a complete obstruction. Uh, so no air gets in and no air gets out. Um, and they are the signs of difficulty and things that can happen at the pharyngeal stage. Last but not least, we're on to signs of difficulty at the esophageal phase. So some people might complain of a feeling of a lump in the throat. Uh, they might have reflux or heartburn, or they might have a feeling of being full after only a small quantity of food or fluid are received. So some additional complications of having dysphagia can result in social isolation. Um, sometimes people would say that they don't know what they can eat safely um, and they might say that they don't want other people to see them having difficulties. Um, and sometimes some people can have um, anxiousness around specific food textures, especially if in a choking experience has occurred and they might avoid all foods that are similar to that texture. Um, a person might have increased time to complete a meal um, because of fatigue or weakness um, or distractibility and this might have an impact on other activities of daily living. Um, another complication would be in reduced independence um, so that they might be dependent on a, on a support staff to give them food or a care. Um, an unexplained weight loss malnutrition or dehydration a person can be, can have respiratory um, difficulties um, and a person can have repeated chest infections with multiple hosp hospital admissions and unfortunately this can be fatal so how can you help and um, so it's really important to read the meal time plan so each person who's been assessed um, and they present with the dysphagia will have a meal time plan and this plan will guide you and inform you about multiple things across the mealtime environment. So it'll tell you about the environment and um, whether that person needs supervision, one to one support, if they like to sit with peers, if they prefer to dine alone and um, what their position will be. It'll signpost that to the OT recommendations. Um, and you'll have pieces on the communication. So how does a person say that they'd like something or they don't like something? Um, it'll direct you to how to support somebody. So what prompt level do they need? Is it physical, verbal, um, visual? Um, it'll tell you about the person's likes and dislikes. It'll tell you about the texture um, of food they need. It'll tell you about the flu they need. It'll tell you about adapted utensils and um, any allergies um, and different um, pieces alongside their healthcare which may impact on the on the meal time for example if somebody has epilepsy um, or if they have really significantly reduced dentition or if they wear dentures and they don't like to wear the dentures or whatever it is um, it's really important that you manage the noise within an environment, like make sure that there's no sudden distractions or that it's not too busy um, and try to keep it nice and calm. Um, you can manage the lighting, so you always want to use natural as much as possible, um, but keeping it bright for visual impairments. Soft lighting can um, often create a calming atmosphere. Um, and then to manage the dining environment, what does it look like? Is there a tablecloth on the table? Um, are there flowers on the table? Is there a tea cosy on the teapot? Um, um, are there plates out? Like how is, how is the dining area dressed? Um, also to be aware of seating arrangements. So some people will like to sit beside other people, some people won't. Some people will have a preference to sit beside the window um, or uh, similarly in that previous um, slide that we talked about, um, if a person was in a wheelchair to make sure that they're, um, to offer them a space that has their, their back to a wall um, rather than to a door. Um, be aware of the smells within the room so um, just in terms of doing like big deep cleans just before a meal time the smell of the disinfectant might not be too appealing um, just before you have uh, your food um, and you want to try to stimulate that 
sensory aspect of um, food delivery. So if you think of yourself when you walk into a shop and you can smell the bakery um, and you're nearly drawn to go over to see where those biscuits or the bread is at um, and that's the smell that's generating a response within you to create more saliva and to generate and make you feel more hungry. Um, then ensure that the person is wearing their glasses, dentures or hearing aids. Um, so it's really important that you check all of those um, and that'll be on the mealtime plan. Some people choose not to wear their dentures but their food texture will be modified to reflect that um, but to encourage it as much as possible um, and just ensure that if they are wearing dentures that they're not loose. Um, the hearing aids is very important because if you're giving somebody a verbal prompt and um, if they don't have their hearing aids in or hearing aids on they won't be able to hear you. Um, think of a person's position. So generally we're looking at a 90-90-90. So your feet are on the floor, you're looking ahead um, and your back is in a nice upright position. Um, depending on the person though and their their spine, this might be slightly different, um, but it'll be specified on the mealtime plan. Um, make sure that you always have the, the person's feet on the floor or on the foot plates um, as much as possible. Um, I know that some people like to sit cross-legged, um, but in general, uh, it would be feet on the floor, feet on the foot plates, ideally. Um, and if you think of it yourself, if you were to lift up your feet off the floor right now and try to maintain that position whilst I go through the rest of the slide, um, it can be very difficult and a bit of an ab workout. Um, so you can only imagine then if you're trying to eat or drink uh, whilst your feet are mid-air, it's very difficult. Um, and then always sit at eye level with the person. So you never want to be supporting somebody with eating and drinking by standing over them. Um, you always want to try to be at, at, at eye level so they can see you. Um, check if the person needs adapted utensils and that'll be that'll be on their mealtime plan. But if it's not on their mealtime plan and, and they're now exhibiting like a tremor or they're having difficulty, you can always get in touch. Um, offer choices and be aware of presentation and temperature. Um, so sometimes um, uh, the presentation of, of foods can be a bit more tricky when it's in a smooth puree consistency but um, using some creative ideas like if you get a zip and seal bag um, cut a corner at the end of it uh, in a diagonal and um, then you can pipe it out of the zip and seal bag and uh, you can use ice cream scoops um, to make them into uh, round shapes um, and presentation is really important um, to stimulate the appetite and also check the temperature of the food and um, so you don't want it to go cold uh, but you don't want it roasting hot either um, tell the person about what they're eating and um, so that's really important and um, to let them know what's on the plate uh, especially if they have a visual impairment um, and it's important to tell the person when you are putting food onto the fork or a spoon um, and transitioning it up towards their mouth that you tell them you know and um, so would you like the peas or the potato no I'd say potato and you're like okay I'll go with the potato first now the potato is on the spoon I'm just bringing it up to your lips here yep there you go and and it's in your mouth um, and also it's really important that you listen to the person's concern um, about their eating and drinking um, and try to support their understanding if they do have a management plan in place um, and it's really important that you observe the person carefully um, and if you see any signs of, of difficulty um, to refer back to SLT. So I said to refer back to SLT, but it's important to note that really dysphagia management is a is a team effort. Um, so the management of the dysphagia includes the person, uh, their support network, um, including their family and healthcare workers. And healthcare workers includes um, uh, nurses, social care staff, um, PICS managers, physio, OT, SLT, uh, psychology, um, just to name a few, um, and the GP and the pharmacist. Um, it's really important that we respect a person's right and dignity, their rights and dignity. Uh, each person must be given information regarding their dysphagia 
and and be told about their management and empowered in their decision making around their management um when if it comes to a time where somebody's food or fluid is altered or changed it is a big change um, and it's really important that we are mindful of this big change and how it can impact a person um some people uh, find it an easy transition to make um, and some people find it more difficult um, but it's really important that we give them all of the information um, and then please note that a person's wishes may be different to other people's so a person's wishes may be different to their families may be different to or the healthcare workers might be different to the GPs and um, and we have to just make sure that that person understands um, and that they feel empowered in in their management um, and that again would be a, a team-based approach so next I'm going to bring you through the IDDSI, which is the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. Um, so it's a global initiative to standardize terminology to describe food and fluid texture. So basically, if you were to go on holidays and you have dysphagia, um, you could go into any healthcare system and you could say, I'm on level two drinks and level six foods. Um, and that healthcare practitioner would understand um, what you mean. And it they'd be able to prescribe you with the exact same as what you would have had at home. Um, so we used to call uh, the different modified foods um, textures and the different uh, modified fluids grades, but now that's all changed to levels. So you can see there we go from level zero um, to four on drinks and then from level seven down to level three on foods. Um, just so you're aware of the terminology. So this next slide is on how to thicken fluids. Um, so for level one, you'd be adding one green scoop to 200 mils of fluid. Level two, two level green scoops to 200 mils of fluid. Level three, three level scoops of 200 to 200 mils of fluid. And then level four is seven level green scoops to 200 mils of fluid. Um, so what you do is you would add the powder uh, to the 200 ml of fluid, stir for 30 seconds, leave for 30 seconds, and then gently stir prior to you serving. Um, but just to note that milk needs a very vigorous whisk with a fork and may need a longer standing time. Um, and I find it easier when you're adding more than one scoop. Um, it's helpful to measure out the fluids to 200 ml in a separate cup um and um there's quite a few down in the houses which have markings on them for 200 mils um and then to add the powder to a different cup um and then when you have the liquid at 200 mils you add in the liquid to the powder and stir as you go along 